Welcome to the Sunday session. My name's Steve Judge. I'm your host for the Football Network World's weekly online discussion with football practitioners around the world. Uh, this evening, I'm delighted to be joined by three top practitioners um, of David Webb, former director of football at Huddersfield, of uh, DC United technical director Stuart Mayers, and Sergio Lara Bercial is the uh, redirector. Leeds Beckett University. Um, but before I sort of introduce you to the guys uh, fully, um, I'll just share with you our plans for this evening's Sunday session. So, what makes a successful manager, head coach, and how do you recruit one? Um, so, the running order for today, obviously, uh, we'll introduce you to the guys and, and they'll each give their, their presentations. And then the discussion will begin. And to begin with, we're kind of looking at defining the traits of a successful coach. And then also what the needs of a club is and how that fits in around, around the club culture. So really in the first half, if you have any questions around those topics, use the Q&A tab down at the bottom of your screen and we'll filter us in as many of those questions from you to the guys. And in the second half, we'll sort of move away from the theory and really look down at the, the reality of things and how, how clubs could go about identifying talent um, in terms of managers and head coaches and how that really narrows down into that process of recruitment. Um, and obviously all the constraints and necessary the compromises that maybe need to be taken when you're making that final decision of hopefully finding yourself a successful manager for your club. But so we can... Uh, have a big, long, deep discussion on that. Let me yeah, start bringing in the guys. Um, I'll, I'll start with uh, Sergio Lara Bercial. Sergio, how are, how are you today? Very well, thank you. Thanks, Steve, and thanks for the invitation to, to join you guys tonight. Um, yeah, very well. Do you want me to do a quick um, rundown of who I am and what I do? Is that? Yes, that is. You, it's almost like you've, you've seen the show before. So uh, yeah, tell us a little bit about <laughs> yourself um little touch on bits of the research that you've done that are related to this topic and then uh, obviously we'll get back to you in a bit for your presentation sure no problem so um first and foremost i want to kind of uh, put my cards on the table i am also a coach okay i'm not just uh, a, an academic i don't sit in my office all day uh, but I, I do coach as well uh, i've been a basketball coach for 25 years came to i'm um, originally from spain uh, but came to the UK back in 1999, 20 odd years ago, um, and and came to play for Liverpool Basketball Club. Uh, I was there for a year, and then I committed treason and and came over to Manchester to play for Manchester, uh, and I've been in Manchester ever since uh, as a coach, both in the uh, well played uh, as a player first, but then as a coach in the men's and the women's program uh, for 20 years now. Uh, but then. On the other side, I did my master's in sports psychology back in 2003, uh, then followed up with my PhD, and I've been working as a lecturer and researcher at Leeds Beckett University uh, since 2011, and my research is into sports coaching at a number of levels, but with a very high interest in understanding, um, you know, what successful high-performance coaches do. So that's me. Thank you. On mute, Steve. Steve, you're on mute. Hi. Right. So, uh, yes, I'm sort of pass over now to uh, Stuart Mez, uh, technical director at, at DC United. Um, obviously, an interesting part of the world to be in right now, Stuart. Yeah, for sure. Um, you know, probably capital of the world for uh, the last week or so. Um, you know, I think, um, you know, obviously getting back to more you know, football matters, I think, um, you know, I've been, the, I've been the technical director at DC for the past two years, uh, came to the club in 2016 uh, as director of soccer strategy. Um, and really my role is to provide, um, you know, uh, the catalyst to speed up uh, our processes uh, within the club um, um, to, to, to make it more successful, uh, whether that's 
um, in the uh, academy process in bringing up players to the to the first team, um, whether it's you know obviously in Loudoun United, which is our um, our affiliate team in, in USL, and and with first team, you know, in terms of your know, roster development um, alongside our general manager Dave Casper uh, and recruitment, um, so you know players, coaches, uh, and staff. So kind of an overarching uh, broad spectrum uh, of of day to day. Uh, responsibilities but um yeah that, that that's my role brilliant yeah thanks Stuart. so we'll uh, find out a little bit more about how your current process of finding a new head coach at dc united is going on um but before then sort of finally to introduce you all to david webb yeah uh, thanks david for joining us tonight i know you're a tottenham fan so to drag you away from today's fa cup game appreciate you preferring to spend your time with us no problem no problem. Um, yeah, so just wondered if you would sort of share a bit of your 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 background and your your pathway through through football. You obviously, had uh, some very interesting uh, roles over the the past four or five years. Yeah, I think I'm going to um, show me age now because I've I got into after sort of stopped playing 2001 2002. With the old, uh, with the old Wimbledon back then, started as, as an academy coach. Progressed my way through onto Crystal Palace as an academy in recruitment, and then from there went to Tottenham in two thousand and five to two thousand and seven as an academy coach and recruitment coordinator. Then from there went to uh, Millwall as head of youth, um, accomplished the A license, did the academy manager's license, and started to enroll on a um something which Sergio and I know a lot about in the masters in sports psychology um through that I did a little bit of work for Bayer Leverkusen just on a consultant basis then after that I went to Southampton purely on recruitment and that was a full-time position looking at 15 to 21 sort of in Europe and across UK um and then first probably senior role of head of recruitment at Bournemouth had just been promoted from league one to the championship very successful periods, managed to, Bournemouth managed to get promoted within two years. So that was a great achievement on behalf of the club. And then from there, went back to work with Maurizio at, um, at Tottenham as head of elite for two and a half years. And again, my job there was 17 to 21 of the best players around the world that we thought could have the capacity to play for Tottenham in the future. After that, um, I went to um, off key a little bit, um, took on a role at Ostersund as a technical director, um, which was um, to build sort of a, on what the good work that Grand Potter had done previously, sort of to bring um, players through to the first team and make them competitive in the Asvenskan. And then that led me up to my sort of previous role into Huddersfield, where um, they took me out of my contract in Ostersunds and then to start a role to help them with the transitioning, just sort of coming down from the Premier League into the Championship. And that sort of brings me to where I am now. Okay, brilliant. Um, so, yeah, David, I think I'll sort of hand the screen over to you now, allow you to sort of yeah, uh, no kick off your, your presentation, I believe, sort of was revolve around sort of the work you did in, in recruiting the the Cowley brothers at, at Huddersfield? Yep. So um, just to sort of give everyone a bit of a background of, of what we did. So it was quite of a whirlwind task and it was, a, it was quite of a quick process we had to undertake at Huddersfield at the time. So as I sort of mentioned then, I was, I was taken out of my contract from Ostersons to Huddersfield to help them with that transition. Um, and the club at that particular period in August 2019 had just gone through an um, unfortunate relegation down from the Premier League into the Championship. It had new ownership um, and it hadn't won a game in 18. So it was a, it was a, whole, it was a whole big sort of transition that needed doing. Um, I was only in the job um, probably two days when a change was made to, uh, from Jan Sievert. Um, where, where the new ownership wanted to sort of in, embrace a new journey and appoint a new manager. So 
um, I had to quickly get up to speed with with what that meant and how we could do it and the time frames that we were looking to do it in. So um, myself, the board and analysis team come up with sort of a strategy um, that what we wanted um, the new head coach manager to look like. So we did, um, what I'm going to do is show you sort of a brief, it was a longer, it was a longer session, but a longer profile, but I've, I've sort of cut it down just for the purpose of this. So um, the first bit, as you can see on your screen, was um, what did we want the coach to have? What sort of background information could he align with what the club values were? So myself, the board, the analysis team got an idea of what we wanted the club to be, how long it was, um, we wanted the journey to undertake. So it was a sort of three-year plan. So we started to look at coaches that could come in and impact the squad straight away. Um, the could resonate with the club values, could resonate with the club, um, Huddersfield as a community. So we looked at, when we were looking at potential coach, first thing we looked at, which was probably everyone expected us to look at sort of win rates and stuff, was the social history of the coach. So what sort of his values would be and sort of his playing style and his, and his history. And that just give us a... A, a bit of information of what type of characteristic profile what we were looking at to bring into the club. So that was sort of the first, first phase. Um, and then on the second one, we wanted to look at um, a manager that had good history and understood um, the sort of the championship in the UK market. And so it wasn't looking at a particular coach where he had to be sort of British, but we just wanted someone that understood that because we needed them to come in and hit the ground running straight away. And the first and foremost was to stop the run of losing games. So a manager that had previous success, um, and that would I be by gaining promotions, winning trophies, had done very well with teams that in these situations before, and and had a good history and someone that the players could maybe pretend potentially resonate with as well. So that was quite important when we looked at that. We was looking at sort of all their history in terms of you know what they had done and what what their journey had looked like from when they first started right up to the present day. And that, again, that sort of went in line with the social and the, and the sort of playing history as well to give us that that sort of growth of what what they would look like as a potential manager for us at that time. And then um, we had a certain playing style and a certain philosophy that we that, that we wanted was part of the sort of long term plan. So again, we wanted a little bit more in depth of um, what the potential coaches sort of play metrics and playing styles would, would look like. So we broke it down into the way that into sort of analysis that we understood. So we looked at attacking and defending metrics as part of um, as part of the profile as well. Again, that give us it wasn't um, the be all and end all, but again, it was just another tool that could help us identify along the process of more discover if we was looking at a certain playing style and the, the metrics of that, the attacking and defending metrics would give us all the, a greater a greater base of um, understanding. This is a little bit more on that as well. So we looked at attacking, defending before. This is all um, just a little bit more from open play. And this and these, these last two slides are sort of based around playing style. Because once we got sort of the characteristics that we narrowed down, we were looking at sort of playing style and something that could resonate with the Huddersfield fans, the community, the ownership, the board. We wanted to try and tick as many boxes as we can. So being a Yorkshire club, the first things we looked at was what 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 means a lot to the fans in terms of and the community. So hardworking players, players that had um, good values. So that would be what they wanted from sort of the playing style. So a manager that could again come in and command that and endorse that on the pitch as well. And this was part of our sort of plan as well for the integration of young players. So what we did look at through sort of recruiting the managers and coaches process was a coach 
or a head coach or a manager that had a good affiliation with young players, that i.e. that they would integrate young players from their academy and their squad, or they had a certain amount of young players that they were used to in their teams over the years that we were looking at. Because at, at the time, that was part of Huddersfield's sort of three-year plan to integrate young players from, from our academy into the first team. Um, we had a whole alignment process all the way through the club. So we wanted a, wanted a head coach or a manager that could really have that sort of affiliation and buy into what, what we wanted, because that was part of the long-term plan was to integrate young players and eventually sort of give them first team exposure, minutes on the pitch. And then with, with that exposure, they would get sort of attracted to maybe higher clubs later on in their careers. So that that was important to us at the time as well. So that so these five slides just give us just gives you sort of a nutshell. There was a there was a little bit more that went into the depth and the process of it, but that just gives you an idea of um, sort of the three things I wanted to highlight: sort of the playing style, the background history, the characteristics of the manager. Did he fit the culture and the values and the alignment of our club? Um, and the final sort of the the attacking and defending the playing styles all the formations that side of that side of it proven success and knowing the English markets hit the ground running and the final bit was was young players that was sort of really big and at the end of it we, we had a summary sort of strengths and weaknesses based on all the stuff we did um, and then we sort of married up within that then it would go through the next phase of maybe approaching for that interview process which led us on then to sort of three or four candidates that once we'd done all this process, there was probably three or four people, um, candidates that were accessible and achievable for us at that time. And within that, we um, identified the, the Cowley brothers as the strongest candidates that fitted the criteria of what we wanted at that time as a football club. Um, they, they certainly had the values of it. Um, they had the proven success that they come all the way up from non-league. So they understood the, the English game. And it was um, also an opportunity for Huddersfield as a football club to give to give two up and coming young managers a chance and exposure to championship football as well. So when we married up everything that, that we thought was was right for us, they become sort of the obvious standout candidates. And then we pursued them and they took on and um, they did very well that, in that season of securing Huddersfield for another season in the championship. Yeah, does that sort of help? Yeah, that's brilliant. Um, yeah, thanks for, for that, David. Um, no at all. We will uh, move on and uh, bring Stuart in for his uh, presentation um, before we sort of get into a deeper dive discussion on, on that process of recruitment. Um, so sure, I'll sort of hand the screen over to you and sort of share the details of how you sort of, uh, I guess, how you're currently going about finding a new coach at, at DC United. Yeah, for sure. Um, and I think it's, you know, we're in a quite a, quite a unique situation to start off with. I, I think, um, you know, we, we haven't had to do this for, uh, you know, for 10 years. Uh, our previous coach was with us for, for Ben Olsen was with us for 10 years and um, played 200 and odd games, you know, for the club before, before that. So, um, you know, I, th I think for us, it's a, uh, as I say, unique situation. Um, I think I was reading in the, in the, an article the other day that in the 25 years of the, of the club's history, we've had seven coaches. Um, so we have stability uh, or have a history of stability in, in our club. And I think, um, you know, like you said, we are still coach, uh, searching for a head coach, but you know, this will be the this will be the most important signing that, that we make in in the off season. Um, you know, we have a little bit of time, and I think um, it's one where be whereby we have had a chance to really reflect uh, and step back, uh, and then hopefully reset. Um, you know, we go through this process in terms of um, you know these three three points here every year. Uh, but I think it's pertinent also to, to this process of hiring a head coach in terms of um, the background and the strategy that we need to, um, or we are taking into account when we're hiring such a, such a person. Um, we always look at, you know, I think these three things, as I said at the start of the season. Um, 
what makes a successful analyst team, uh, how are we going to be better than the competition, uh, and are we clear on our weaknesses? Uh, and I think it's important what, since having a um, obviously having a head coach for ten years that we take a step back and reflect on how we can do things better. Um, and uh, and hence the you know the the good I, I would have thought two weeks we spent um, when we knew we were going to hire a new head coach. Uh, putting together a, a strategy and a process. Um, for me, the process is, is, is always the most important part. Um, I, I think there are numerous things and, and numerous um, areas where we need to assess in order to get the, you know, to get the right fit of player uh, or coach, should I say, and player. Um, the big thing, I think, around cultural fit is, is massively important. Um, you know, DC United itself was built on, uh, or it has a long history of, uh, of bringing in, you know, attractive uh, Latin American players. Um, you know, Jaime Moreno and Marco Echeverri, you know, the fans are used to uh, watching entertaining football. And so it's important that, um, as David was alluded to, bringing in a coach that uh, can connect uh, with our fan base, connect with our culture and identity. Um, and I think, you know that that essentially is 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 the bedrock of 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 how we how we would recruit. But my role in this process, I think, is is one that uh, hopes to keep some balance. Um, we have, as I said, we had a two week real process whereby um, we involved everybody in the front office in terms of who was going to make the decision on this coach. So, um, you know, our general manager Dave Casper, our ownership group, we really wanted to to find what are the principles you know what are what is the style what is the um you know the vision of of the new coach um and you know my role in all this is to to hopefully bring some strategy some alignment and some clarity so that we have something to assess by uh when we are hiring that that coach uh and then we can always go back to that uh we can always say well you know not everybody is going to agree on uh, on the right person um, so for me, it was prioritizing essential criteria. What do we want? Uh, and for that, we need to look within our club. As I say, going back to the cultural fit, going back to what works in MLS, what styles work in MLS, what is a, a modern approach, what we think will be successful, um, because we're not necessarily hiring a coach for now, but the future, we are hiring for now. But I think as a, as a technical director, you always have to think medium to long term uh, as well. Um, and as I say, adding balance and structure to the process and supporting and challenging that process in terms of what we know and the, and, and the information that we've gathered uh, when we are, you know, portraying these coaches to our to our ownership group. Um, really important to ensure that everyone understands that process, you know, so that, you know, when we make a decision, it's everybody's decision. Uh, and we have a uh, and again, going back to something to assess by. Um, we have to believe in that process and assess the framework, as I've alluded to. And, uh, and my role, obviously, is to deliver suitable candidates based on that essential criteria. Um, when we started this process in that, I would say, two-week process at least, and it's still kind of being you know, evolving, but we, we have that core criteria, obviously, now. There are a number of different things that, that, we've, that we, can, we, we can point to that, that came up on that kind of sticky board of traits that, that we may want to look at. Uh, and so what we did, we, we narrowed this down to essentially five core criteria, five essential criteria that we wanted to, to, to hire a head coach by, uh, almost an essentials and then some desirables, uh, you know, in terms of a job description type role. Um, at the start, we weighted these as well. So what was really important to us uh, and what was not, uh, and, or not as important to us, um, uh, and went around the whole group essentially, you know, essentially ranking those those traits uh, and as i say so we got to five uh, that were the five criteria that we thought we could assess and, uh, and wanted to bring in a head coach um, uh, regarding those regarding those rules i guess um, so these were the, i guess and some of the things that, that we really wanted to or or thought about in terms of uh, when we bring in that head coach um, you know i think you know when you're hiring a head coach um, and when you're when you're bringing in a player for that matter, um, you know you need to put the right tools around him or her to be able to be successful. Uh, and 
you know, you, I don't think you can ever get a hire or a, um, a recruiting a player 100% right. Um, um, the old adage, you know, that you're doing your due diligence and getting to a stage where you can be as good as you can get in terms of that decision making process, I think rings true. But I think it's an important aspect when we were looking at this to, to identify who we are as a club and, and always go back to that uh, and what we want. Uh, so, you know, in, in the past and what we've been doing, what we're currently doing at present and, and have been doing for, for a short while is, is how do we, how do, how are we monitoring these coaches and how are we, how are we, um, you know, eventually going to bring those, you know, select the right coach. Um, you know, I think as David alluded to some of the, some of these uh, styles and, and um, you know, principles will, will, will pop up in, in, in team play, right? You know, you know what, what, what team do we like watching? What team do we think is going to be resonate with us to be, you know, a best fit? Uh, and then, you know, is that, is that the, the style and the, uh, and the fit that we want for our club? Uh, maybe it's looking at best fit teams and coaches, whether it's, you know, like, like David uh, posted there before, attacking offensive uh, metrics. You know, do we want to be a more pressing team? Do we want to be more direct? Uh, there's data out there that, 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 that can show this uh, and monitor that on a rolling basis. Um, you know, things like game state, you know, are coaches brave? Do they, do they go for the win when it's a tie or, or do they not? Do they sit back? So again, it all goes into the type of culture and, and style and fit of the, of the team um, that translates over to the coach. Uh, and you can use data to, 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 to monitor these and, um, uh, and, and portray that in your, in your final document that, that essentially goes to the ownership group. Um, you know, squad age, you know, and squad succession planning is, is, is an important one. If you're playing a high pressing team, then you probably want a younger squad. Uh, again, looking within, look at in the age of our squad, where do we want to be if we want to be a pressing team? Um, uh, and you can look at uh, coaches' tenure in terms of have they continued with their sustainable success in getting results, but also playing with a younger team. Um, you know, looking at squad strengths, you know, it, are there, are there uh, coaches out there that are overachieving with their, with their team? Um, you know, there's a lot of um, work you can do around expected points versus the average points. And, you know, is, is a team over a course of a certain coach's tenure, um, you know, overachieving in terms of results? Um, has that coach improved um, their, you know, their, their ranking, uh, their global ranking or the ELO ranking in terms of, um, you know, points that they would pick up again when they shouldn't do. Um, so a lot of these things you can, you can, you can start to, to, to monitor and, uh, and benchmark. Uh, and again, obviously we would, we would monitor the social media aspects as well. I mean, there's, I think there's certainly times when um, you would discard a coach simply on the fact of, uh, of some of what they do on social media is the reality of it. Uh, or what they're, you know, what, what has been found out. Um, you know, you're almost kind of like a private investigator in, in some instances in terms of looking into the background of, of these coaches. So, you know, there's, there's easy ways for us to whittle uh, those, those coaches down, as David said, to get to a four, five, six candidates. Um, but for us, our process, of, because we've, you know, we've not done this in a while and we had some time, we really, you know, took the time to, to, to see what's out there. And, you know, you know, when you're looking for a coach, certainly in the championship, um, you know, as, as we mentioned earlier offline, I think when you bring in a coach in, the reality is that in two years' time, that coach isn't going to be there. Uh, so, you know, I think that there is a need now to, you know, to be to be looking at coaches the way you look at players. Um, you know, in MLS, obviously, there is no promotion relegation. So, you know, I think history has shown that you get a little bit more time. But um, the league is super competitive now. And, um, you know, it, it, that more and more, you know, decisions have to be correct, uh, you know, in the league, given it's, it's a salary cap league. So, you know, those are some of the, the, the things that we would maybe do to, to, to monitor coaches. Um, but but it, I think it all goes back to this in terms of, you know, what do you want to be? Uh, it's unlikely that you'll ever get 100% uh, fit in terms of your core criteria. Um, and nobody is more than an 80% fit. This was actually a quote, quote, by, quote by Dave Sleeman and, uh, of elite performance partners who um, you know, I was chatting to at the start of this process. Uh, and that really gave us a, a little bit of a, um, a framework to say, you know, we, we have to get as much as we can of this right. 
uh, but what are our non-negotiates, non-negotiables, and what what you can trade off? Um, you know, we weighted our framework and rated our essentials to to rank our candidates, um, and you know, I, I think ideally what we would like is you know sustainable success in a coach, but with a high upside. Um, you know, an educator, someone who's a thirst for uh, for knowledge, someone who can um, you know motivate and transform our staff. Um, that type of person, um, I, I think, works within our works within our club, um, and, and you have to support them. Like it's not just hiring a process; it's then the process after. Uh, you know, you have to support them. I, I mean, our general manager has a, has a good one that he that he pulls out. He says, you know, that head coach is like a chef. You know, if you give him the wrong tools and the wrong ingredients, he's not going to make a very good meal. So, uh, you know, I think, you know, the the idea of the idea of us, you know, once we've made this hire, making sure we support that coach, uh, you know, in terms of the essentials that we brought him into, um, you know, to, 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 to work on, to hire him by. Um, because if he's not doing, he or she, if, if they're not doing that role, then we can, you know, fire them and say, you're not doing what we brought, you know, what we, what we brought you in to do. Um, so I think this idea of a, you know, of a framework of a, um, of a strategy is one that's something that's um, going to be a little bit more prevalent, but one where, which we realise is important to us uh, and hopefully one that we, um, you know, can stick with and, and hire, you know, the correct coach. So that is, that's my point. Brilliant. Yeah, thanks a lot. For that, Stuart, um, yeah, looking to uh, diving in into that in a moment. Um, sort of bring in Sergio, who sort of uh, had the luck, joy of sort of finding clubs and individuals who have had the good fortune of hiring successful coaches and a bit of find out a bit more about your research, Sergio, and into what made those coaches successful. Thank you. Thanks, Tim. And, and thanks a million to David and Stuart. Uh, fascinating listening to, to your presentations, guys. So, uh, yeah, we were very lucky. Um, a few years ago, we were able to complete what we called the Serial Winning Coaches Study, okay, through a collaboration between my university and the International Council for Coaching Excellence. And um, basically, we were able to access 17 coaches who had won multiple gold medals and major trophies. And, and by that, I mean... Olympic gold medals, world championships, and major trophies. Um, between them, over 160 gold medals and trophies uh, between them. Uh, and we also were able to, to talk to 19 of their athletes because we wanted to really make sure that we were getting both sides of the story and see if there were any discrepancies. Uh, but a very, very peculiar study because uh, no one has really been able to access this kind of um, caliber of sample really so very fortunate to be involved with this now uh, typically in, um, in in coaching research uh, a lot of the studies that have ha happened before our study uh, were really focused on identifying the coach behaviors okay they were really looking at coaches on the ground uh, in you know on the pitch uh, so to speak and looking at what happens in those two hours or 90 minutes on the pitch and, and we thought that that was kind of just the tip of the iceberg, really, that coaching, as you all know, is a lot, it's about much more than just what happens on the pitch. So we wanted to understand what happens off the pitch, but also we wanted to understand the person. Uh, we, we're, very, uh, we're very strong on the, uh, this idea of a coach or an athlete uh, are first and foremost a person and everything they do. Um, comes from somewhere, okay? So we wanted to look underneath the water and find out about their personality traits and motivations. We wanted to understand the, uh, their values and belief systems, their, their philosophies really for, for life and for coaching. We wanted to look at the day-to-day, -day, the, the full 24 hours, not just the, um, the time on, on the pitch. And, and overall, we also wanted to look at the leadership style, okay? So a pretty big... Uh, piece of research uh, and I'm just going to summarize uh, for the sake of today some some key traits that we discovered. Uh, some of them have been mentioned, uh, the majority of them, but I, I'll go with this really. So really uh, first thing that we saw is that all these guys had a really strong vision uh, of how they wanted to do things really and and a real focus on, on the things that matter um, and, and that really strong vision of this is what I want to happen and this is how I like it and and 
And this is how things are done in my patch it was something that, that came through very strongly, um, that, that really strong philosophy of how things happen. At the same time, we found a group of guys that were incredibly emotionally stable. Um, and that doesn't mean that they don't sometimes might, might lose their head in the middle of a game, or, but overall, very emotionally stable, um, not only during coaching or in games, but in general. So these are people that don't don't lose their head that regular. They, they, they don't do this all the time. They're pretty flat in, in their emotions. And, and as you know, this is a very dynamic and high pressure profession, really. So I think being like this really pays off if you're going to stay involved for, for a sustainable amount of time, really. No surprise, they were workaholics, okay? Really, really high work ethic. And repeatedly, the phrase was, I'm, I can't really allow anybody to outwork me, okay? That's, that's something that was really strong. Um, they were also very people-oriented, and they were described as people-oriented by the athletes. What does that mean? That they're generally good with people. They don't have to be the heart and soul of the party. They don't have to be a joker or, or a laugh a minute. But they're very good with people uh, and they're comfortable around people and, and they, they are happy being around people and dealing with people all the time. Uh, again, no surprise. But, uh, but again, I think the surprise is that uh, these guys actually spend time fostering this. They, they were really interested in people and they, um, like I say, out of the other 22 hours of the day, they spend a lot of their time with people um, because that they felt that that was really important. Now, I've just said that they were workaholics, but over the period of their careers, they all described this um, having to find a, a relative work-life balance. Um, that Understanding that they are in a profession that requires them to work a lot of hours and to travel a lot, um, that within all of that, they were able, they had found something that worked for them as a kind of work-life balance. And they thought that that was really, really important to help them stay on, on you know, in top shape to, to be to be the best coach saying I need to be comfortable within myself to be able to to be the best coach I can be so again each of them found different solutions interestingly out of the 17 uh, 16 of them were married with children um, and only one of them had got divorced uh, which again uh, it'd be interesting to talk to their wives at some point but we didn't do that um, very interesting as well we had we found guys that were very high on two scales, very egotistic. They, they were desperate to win and desperate, de desperate to do well for themselves, but at the same time, genuinely interested in, in doing well for others, in supporting players achieve their dreams, in supporting people become the best version of themselves. A, a very strong balance of doing things for me and doing things for others, um, really well balanced. Uh, no surprise, they were go-getters. They, they don't wait for things to happen to them. They make them happen uh, and they try to influence everything around them, uh, from the players to something that was really important. Uh, and I'm not sure how Dave and Stuart are going to like these, but the, these guys were very, very comfortable trying to manage upwards. So they felt that part of their job was to influence those making decisions above above them. Um, they were very good students, tremendous, really, uh, like the, the, their thirst for knowledge was, you know, unmatched by by other coaches, really. They, they just... Um, and not only within the sport, they were avid readers, they were constantly trying to talk to people that they could learn something from. Um, and interestingly, and I think this is really, really fundamental, uh, we found them to be very cognitively and emotionally flexible. So cognitive, they can, they can think in different ways and they can find multiple solutions to, to problems and they can see things from different perspectives. And emotionally, they are they're quite able to deal with, uh, they're very resilient. They are able to cope with extremely charged environments. They don't take things personally. They move on really quickly from, from failure, from, from, com from conflict. Uh, they're, they're very, very good at that, really. Uh, and then the final thing that I'm gonna mention for now is that all of these kind of came together into a particular leadership style that we called driven benevolence or caring determination. In other words, the relentless pursuit of excellence, they are absolutely determined to win and, and they will do everything in their power to win, but that's balanced with a genuine and compassionate desire to support athletes and, and oneself. So it's not win at all cost. It is win, but they also, they move along this continuum of, what, you know, they're like, like a chameleon, really. They, they know when they have to be really, let's say, aggressive or driven or determined, but at the same time, they can quickly move to a place where they are more like a parent or, or a friend to, to an athlete or, 
or to a member of staff, um, they, they're able to move along along that. And, and that's what I'm going to stop for now, and hopefully we'll get into some further discussions. Thank you. Okay, yeah, lovely. Thank you, uh, Sergio, Stuart and David. Three uh, great presentations there. I um, think, yeah, with our discussion, maybe then to, to begin and just follow on a little bit from the traits that were highlighted there by Sergio and, and David, just theoretically, I mean, if we're just talking about what makes a, a successful coach, I mean, what are the, the key traits that, that stand out for you? Yeah, it was really interesting from um, Sergio's perspective what he found because um, prior to even looking at when I was at Huddersfield, I had the pleasure of working with sort of two fantastic coaches, one in Maurizio and Eddie Howe, that the people orientated stuff like natural leaders, where where someone like Maurizio would be extremely driven, hard working because of the way he played on the pitch very demanding um, in terms of training sessions and what are the expectations of the players. But um, around the training ground was was very friendly and open with everyone. So I think these, these key qualities, which they have, like you say, these chameleon switches to you know, emotionally stabilise and balance themselves where they can be go-getters, like you alluded to, winners at one point and then be um, have a real understanding and affiliation from everyone from from all broads of, of the spectrum, all broads of life. I think that's and have the charisma to you know to pull people into you. I think that's that's quite a key, especially when you're leading a group of high profile football players. So some of them characteristic traits were sort of really interesting and. Um, even Daniel and Nikki were very at Huddersfield were very good at that. They were very good at. Um, to all the members of staff, not just the playing staff or the football staff. It was people at stadium, sort of down to the catering staff, people as you came into the training ground, HR, because, and that was kind of what we wanted because it's understanding what your club is and having them rounded people skills um, to transmit your message, not only on the pitch to the players in terms of performance, but it's a consistent message all around the club. Because if you are, if you're not a genuine character, you'll certainly get sort of highlighted um, pretty quickly, especially in a you know a brutal industry like football. So those those compassion, those human qualities really do play a key role, I think, in leadership and management style, and with driving your club forward. I mean, on that, Stuart, I mean, is that obviously you had a, a manager at the club for 10 years. I mean, would that fit in with that, that sort of role? What you, you'd seen, the man you're looking to replace? I mean, you're we're sort of then defining those qualities of, of leadership. It goes far beyond just the 11 players on the pitch. Yeah, I think so. I, I think, um, you know, our, our previous head coach was a fantastic man manager. I think first and foremost, I think he was very well respected, you know, you know, he's a good guy, he's excellent in the community, you know, the players liked him uh, and it was a very, it was a very emotional time, I think, for the whole club uh, when he moved on. Um, I, I think um, in any, you know, in, in any form of, uh, of you call it a crisis or any form of, of change or any form of when you're under a little pressure for results and things aren't going your way that that is um you know results aren't going your way you've got things on your back um I, leadership always wins I think in that, in that aspect. Um, and, you know, I think again, it, like, you know, again, it'll come down to that, to people, it'll come down to the club and in terms of, um, you know, how, how you are treated, you know, how you're treated at, at the club. I mean, it's, you know, you want uh, to build a commitment culture within your club. You want people to work with you. So when the hard times are hard, they work at, they work harder. Um, and, and I think that's the, the fundamental for, 
um, you know, for, for sustainable success, you know, is, is the people around you. When you lose that, when you start to lose a dressing room, which I don't think necessarily we, we, we did, but, um, you know, when you start to, to lose that, it, it's very difficult to get back. Um, and, and, and I do think that, you know, emotional intelligence, I think, in, in a coach is, is, is huge. Um, and it, it's something that, um, you know, what Sergio alluded to there, some of those traits were, you know, were essentially some were, were actually quite similar to some of the traits that, that, that you know, we're, we're, we're looking for. Um, because you want the head coach to take everyone around them, um, like a clock, for example, to take everyone around them and say, come with me. You're coming, you're, you guys are coming with me. Uh, and uh, I think that is the type of, uh, of, 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 of person that, um, that you want to work for. You know, I think it just, it just does. It just comes down to, it just comes down to that, right? It's, you, you want to go into work every, every day, you know, happy that you're there. Uh, and I think certainly, certainly in this situation and in these current environments that we're in, you know, that commitment culture around the club is, is so important, not just for performance, but now sustainability for the club itself, <laughs> you know, in terms of, in terms of keeping them, you know, um, above water, you know, so, you know, I think, I think certainly, you know, I would agree that, that, that those, those traits are, are, are huge in terms of any, any head coach who's going to be the face of an organization. I mean, um, from the, your, your uh, research there, Sergio, I don't know if there, was, if there was one, obviously there was lots there and, and not one single trait, dare we say, would be the key. But if there was one, if there was one that you would say is absolutely essential that you found that was, that you heard repeated time after time after time and not just from the feedback from the coaches, but obviously having it also from the players that, but the one that really stood out? Uh, yeah, I, I'd have to give you two, Steve, if you allow me, really, because uh, I think... Absolutely, I will allow uh, you. When you get a, a, at this level of... Um, I mean, we're talking about the best coaches in the world for... I mean, we, we had coaches from 10 sports and, and 10 different countries, OK? Um, and obviously, they all know their sport, like the back of their hand. They, there's, you know, at that level, everybody knows the sport. You, you, don't, you don't get to that level without knowing the sport, really. Um, and a lot of them had a, a past as a, um, as a former elite athlete as well, okay? But they were not elite athletes that were fast-tracked. They, they were elite athletes that um, had really, while still being an athlete, you know, a lot of them had a sports degrees or management degrees. They, they were studious. They were prepared people, right? But if you ask me for two, for one, one or two things, really, um, for me, one is that they've been people-oriented, you know, being good with people. Um, and like I said, you don't have to be... Mother Teresa or, or anything like that. It's just you just have to be comfortable around people and and genuinely interested in 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 people. And because I think everyone can win once by being a dictator, but that's not sustainable. And I think if if you're looking for sustainability and, and like these guys, so the, the majority of these guys have been coaching for thirty plus years um, and been able to keep winning you know, over 30 years with different teams in different countries. And um, that doesn't happen if you, if you if you are someone that people don't want to work with because word gets round, really. If you are if you're a bad person, people don't want to work with you. And people have more choice now. And, and that's clear. And for me, the second big factor is this idea of uh, being really cognitive and emotionally flexible. Um, to me, that's such a strength, really. Is, I mean, I think in the past that's been seen as a weakness um, because what these guys have seem to be very good at is they have you know, incredibly strong philosophies and, and ways of doing things. But within that, they behave with a huge amount of flexibility. So they know their north, uh, but within that, they're able to move around to fit the situation, to fit the person in front of them, to fit, you know, when they're on a, on a, on, you know, in a bad run of results. Um, and I think that's tough. You know, that sort of chameleon character of a, uh, I know exactly where I'm going and I know exactly how I want things to be done, but I, I can allow myself to step back and go, well, actually I have to, even if it means losing face or swallow hard, I have to do this in a different way or I have to listen to someone because that's a good idea. Um, that's tough. And at that level where you're expected to always know everything and always be able to to have the, the right answer all the time, to be able to say, actually, I'm not sure or let's try something different. or yeah, I think that's that's fantastic, really. 
And with that, um, David, um, yeah, I don't know if there was anything more you'd want to add on the managerial side of things before I kind of just switch it round to just defining for, for David, how you then start to define, which you have to do very quickly in your case, you know, the, the, the needs of the club uh, and, and the culture that you're in. But I don't know if there was anything you wanted to add on the while we're defining, you know, what, are, what are the key qualities in a, a successful coach before we move on to the, to the club side of things? Yeah, I think I think just one small point. There's been some great information there um, from Sergio and both Stuart on on sort of how they perceive and how what what sort of top coaches in top elite organisations um, should look like. But for, for me, we probably haven't touched on it. Was the environment was always key. So what we're bringing a potential head coach into and where he's coming from. And sort of the history that went beyond that, and that would maybe bring up some sort of traits and uh, and some of the stuff that sort of Sergio and, Sh and Stuart have alluded to. So environments was 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 key for us at Huddersfield to establish some of those psychological traits really quickly. That's what I'd say. And obviously, then within within the within sort of moving to Huddersfield, I mean, you're having to very quickly, not unlike Stuart, who's had 10 years, people there had 10 years to get a handle of the club and know what's going on, although I don't think Stuart's been there the whole 10 years, but you had two days. So you had to really very quickly put in for yourself a process of understanding what's this club about, what do they actually need before you start worrying about, yeah, the traits of the coach. What were the, how do you then sort of go in and defining the traits of the club? Yeah, it was an interesting one because I'd only been, I've been to Huddersfield um, before and I understood a little bit about the area um, to, for, for a former colleague, Stuart, Stuart Weber, who was, who was there before me. So, but I had to quickly get up to the club and sort of align myself with, with definitely sort of the ownership, the ownership team. Um, um, members of different departments and, and get a real sort of feel for, for what the club is, where the club wants to go, what's the values of the club, what sort of area it is as well. Um, Huddersfield's obviously in, in Yorkshire. It's a hard working town. So it was just trying to get used to those, that environment and, and, and those surrounding factors really, really quickly and then come up with... Um, that I mentioned before on, on the on the presentation was of analysis structure that could do it. We didn't like do it really quickly within sort of a certain time frame. We didn't have the luxury of um, say so right. Um, we've got we've got four or five months. With the team's in a good state because they hadn't won in a long time. The need and the pressure was quite demanding. So, and obviously we had a squad which was quite unsettled and unbalanced as well. So it did need some you know, a strong leadership coach team in there pretty quickly, but also keeping in line of what we wanted that coach to look like, not drifting away, panicking, just say, well, we want an instant name or an instant succession just to come in and stop the rock winning games. We wanted that, obviously, but we also wanted someone that could be buy into what, what we wanted in terms of the medium, um, the short, medium and long term. So to buy in with the integration of young players and really understand what Huddersfield is about. And that's where we come up with sort of that analysis of the characteristics profile we wanted in a coach, the succession, what they what they had before. So players could resonate with that, um, especially in a time when they weren't winning games. And also that understood the um, UK market and we was open to all candidates, didn't have to be sort of British based, even Danny and Nikki was, they could, just someone who understood the market quickly, so they could hit the ground running quickly to give them the best chance of success. Um, and also the young players, that was part of sort of a long term new ownership strategy of integrating young players from the from the academy and I don't know if sort of some of the viewers are aware that Huddersfield hasn't got a, an academy of nines all the way through to first team. It's, it's cut off point is sort of under 17s up. It's quite similar to um, like the Brentford model. So 
we felt that that was sort of a route that we could get players into our first team quite quickly and get a handle on that. So um, when we when we come out with all of that, I thought, well, we need to narrow down our focus search really quickly. So that's when we come up with that with that strategy, and and from that as well, it comes from the season had already started, so managers were already in place that potentially could have fit that criteria. Um, achievable managers from different clubs, if there's already at different clubs, managers that were potentially not working at the moment. And then you have to weigh up all those factors, the characteristics, the win records, the bringing through young players, their playing styles, philosophies, integrating all, all, all of ours, and then come up with a criteria in this um, that we wanted to um, that we wanted to speak to. And then through that, we we got five that we wanted to that we did manage to speak to sort of on an interview process. So again, we have to get a feel for what they're what they're like as people. It gives them a chance to get a feel for us, and then we can sort of you know realign what what we what we found out during our um, analysis stage of, of of what they are really about, and then that narrowed down to um, sort of two potential high caliber sort of coaches, and um, where we got to sort of a second interview. Um, and that, again, that was a real sort of narrow focus of, um, right, who's going to be the best fit now for our club? Um, and then out of that, Danny and Nicky sort of tick, ticked all the boxes we were looking for at that time for Huddersfield. So I'd say the whole process from start to finish where, let's say, Stuart's had the luxury of, you know, got the luxury of a little bit of time. It's just giving an example of maybe what it's like at, um, we haven't got that luxury of time. You have to make decisions really, really quickly and assess the needs of the club really, really quickly without around the luxury of knowing the in-depth history um, as much as I would like. So you wanted to make sure that the decisions that, that were made would sort of tip the odds. You can't guarantee that, but to tip the odds hugely in our favour and to have more ticks, more tick boxes and not. So, and in the end, um, at the end of the season, it was it was achieved. The achievement was to keep the team in the championship was one tick, bring through young players, which they did, um, realign the team, help um, myself as a sporting director build that relationship to build the values and the strategy of the club driving forward. So there was a lot of, um, from that perspective, it, it, year one of that particular process was, was achieved by the club. So even though in terms of Huddersfield didn't, win anything or didn't get around the playoffs it was part of that three-year plan was to maintain championship status help help realign the squad bring through young players help transition departments um and which danny and nikki and myself we were sort of pivotal doing so see that as a pretty successful year is that no uh sort of alludes he does there Stuart. we're sort of all saying you've had the luxury of uh extra time but no, some ways is there an advantage for, say, a very small advantage for David that coming into that situation, he's not clouded by the history. He wasn't then looking at where we were when he's really assessing what were our needs now. Where I think particularly it was interesting in your process is where you have this annual review, which enables you to actually understand where you are in any given year. I mean, how, how key is that when you actually understand now, what is that? What are we historically in, and what are we now? I think it's important for sure, uh, but I, I, I think also in any you know, if you're in this type of role, you know, uh, you know, sporting director, Dave, or technical director, whatever it is, I think it's your, it's, it's probably part of your job to, to 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 keep to keep tabs on this type of process, right? And more often than not, it happens quite a lot. So. You know, I'm sure David would have had to, to, to hire a, a manager at, at Ostersunds. And these guys, I think, coaches, when you're hiring a head coach, you, you tend to have someone in mind, I think. Most of the time, you'll tend to have someone in the back. Rather than, rather than sort of getting ahead now and sort of just really now just wanted to allude to you're assessing your club. What are the needs of my club? What is when we're sort of defining the cultural fit? So looking just now, just to define, so we've defined what is be a successful coach and that process is where you define what are the needs of the club? What are you looking at? And I think, again, 
do you have the luxury of a bit more time, which Stuart didn't have, but I think also Stuart is then is not biased by I've been here for five years and I'm looking at what we were rather than what we are. Yeah, for, yeah, for sure. Yeah, for sure. For sure. How you get that balance of, you know, what, what we are historically and how you how you go about getting that balance to understand what are our needs now versus, you know, what we are historically yeah. as a club. Yeah, yeah, I think I think it's important for us to, to to reset. You know, it's important. It's important for us to to again know know our strengths and weaknesses and where and where we are. You know, I think um, we don't necessarily just want to hire another coach um, that that maybe has done the same thing. You know, we 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 have to, you know, we have to to, to take stock and and look where the league is going. You know, we you know in that respect we. We kind of know that, you know, we, we, we have, you know, data, we have information on where the, uh, you know, the league is heading. And so, you know, I think, you know, for us, we have a, a pretty clear idea of, uh, of where we are um, or where we want to go. Um, but I think, in, but, I, but I, again, I think in any kind of role of a technical director, a sporting director, it's probably part of the role to, to be adaptable, right? You have to be adaptable. Um, you have to know what the market trends are. You have to know what, uh, or as best you can, you know, if you're going to a Huddersfield, you know, I'm, I'm pretty sure David would have a, a good idea of where, you know, uh, of what he would be dealing with, but has to work on a shorter time frame. But, you know, for me, certainly, you know, knowing what we are certainly helps us. Uh, and it helps us to build a framework out that is, you know, hopefully going to set us for the medium to long term. Um, you know, as I said, we had a coach for 10 years, you know, you know ideally you'd want another coach for 10 years, but, you know, it's, it doesn't, doesn't work out that way a lot of the time. I mean, Sergio, you sort of pointed out that, the, the, again, you agreed with the guys with their presentations, everyone sort of this idea of the cultural fit being highly important, but, um, you know, the, you have a strong leader coming in. I mean, surely they're the cultural leader, they're setting the tone. It's impossible just to have a coach who could just come in and, completely change the culture of a club. I think that's where, I mean, again, from, from what we saw in these guys, they are, while having a really strong philosophy and way of doing things, they are, they're also quite, uh, quite good to, to not want to change everything straight away if it doesn't need changing. I think one of the elements that these guys talk about all the time was the idea of, well, Elite sport, high performance sport, is very complex, and there's lots of uh, moving moving pieces really. And, and I think one of the main jobs that you have to do as a coach is to to really simplify that complexity. We we came up with this idea of simplexity, taking this complex picture and making it simple into the things that really matter. So, what these coaches were able to do all the time, but I think this would be even more important when you go into a new club, is t- to really have a clear idea of what needs to change. You don't have to change the whole thing. It's, it's what is going to give you the biggest return because if you true, I mean, and at times there might be that what it might be that some sometimes what what's needed is a, is a whole wholesale change, right? Um, but I think most of the times that's probably not the best way to go into a situation, uh, you know, like a like a bull in a china shop. Um, so while they have to really probably develop their own culture. Um, I think it's important that they understand what the culture they're going into is, uh, and, and see where where the biggest change is needed, and, and whether that's a change that is, you know, a, a change within the changing room, or a change at at the board level, or a change at the whole club level. Okay, um, but to go back to your question, really, uh, to me, based on what we know and, and listening to to the guys. There, there is the, uh, the the cultural fit and there's also the situational fit. So does the coach fit the culture, but does the coach also fit the situation that the club is in? Because they come into a, they come into a club at a different point. So it could be that the club is in a in a massive losing run. So how what do we know about this coach in this kind of situation? Uh, maybe that the the club is completely rebuilding. So are you? Because I think it's. it's Something that the um, something that something that these coaches talked about all the time is, whenever I've gone into a new job, I've gone into that job expecting to be there for quite some time. So although I know that I have to win quickly, I've always gone in with a long term mentality. Uh, clubs may may have to really explore their own philosophy really and decide whether they are 
trying to bring in a coach that is going to do a, a three month job and then they will look for a long term coach because I think that's those are different recruitment strategies really am I looking for a, someone for a few months or am I looking for someone for the next 10 years and, and we know that's unlikely but that's what we're all hoping for we're all hoping that we find someone that can be with us I was saying before uh, before the webinar when live, I support Atletico Madrid. We were known for being a club that sacked coaches every three months. And the stability we've had with Simeone for the last eight years, we've never known anything like that. It's a dream come true for us. Uh, so that, that that's something significant, I think. I mean, Stuart, we kind of find, like you say, you're, you're also been fortunate having a coach for 10 years, which you said was... See, again, you, you, you count yourself very lucky if the next hire also lasts for 10 years. But then when in that sort of process, which you started to allude to before I, uh, before I pulled you back a little bit in terms of that talent idea of, of managers and sort of having this idea in your head. So even though you've had a manager for 10 years, you've always you've kept monitoring managers. I just wonder how that process of monitoring managers and, and how you're sort of, again, it's almost like you're, like you would with scouting players, you know what type of player are going to be fits for you, sort of how you're then, how, how are you going about sort of understanding what managers out there? Are you looking particularly at just certain leagues or styles of play across the world? Or Yeah, I, I, think, I think there are certainly, um, and again, the, the first part of this goes back to, you know, how you want to play and what is your structure and what is your identity? Are you going to be this type of, what type of team do you want to be? So, you know, certainly I think, um, you know, a lot of, um, a lot of teams and a lot of leagues now are looking towards this kind of, you know, high press, gag and press type of, um, you know, type of style, um, you know, a lot of actions in the final third, uh, a lot of uh, transitions, you know, MLS is, uh, MLS is going that way a little bit as well. Um, you know, the traits of, you know, successful, a lot of the successful teams, um, you know, are, are going kind of that way. Um, and, you know, essentially, you know, we, we think probably that's the, you know, the route that, that, that we will need to go. Now, it's then up for us to define how far we want to go with that style and then trying to find a coach that, um, that, that fits that style. And there are certainly uh, countries and leagues that, that, that we've identified um, that fit the style, uh, but fit the, the personality of the coach as well. So an educator, you know, like as you're saying, a thirst for knowledge, uh, you know, a people catcher as the term is, um, I guess that, that people, some people use. So, you know, I think that allows us to focus on, uh, uh, and, and again, we've, we've interviewed uh, coaches like that, that, you know, maybe we don't think necessarily, necessarily are, are ready right now, but in maybe the next cycle, um, you know, we think we'll be really, really top uh, coaches. Now, whether that time comes and then we can't get them is, is, another, is another issue. So there's a balance for us there in terms of timing, in terms of, you know, when, when we want to take these types of coaches out or when we want to try and take these coaches out um, and fit them us and, and try and develop them and support them as I've, I've alluded to. So, you know, I think certainly, uh, yes, that there are ways in which we monitor, uh, whether it's style, we, you can do this all through data, right? You can do this all through, um, you know, um, looking at certain leagues, how, how different leagues compare against each other, how certain teams compare against each other. You know, we're, we're the, you know, Rebels, for example, you know that they're going to be a really high pressing, you know, uh, direct team. Um, you know, Leicester, for example, are a little bit different. They're, you know, they're high press, but they press and possess. So there, there are styles that you can that you can take uh, that, that, that we want to kind of aim to or get to. Uh, and you start from there, and it's a, and, you know as I say, it's a good as good a position as any to to try and identify you know best fit teams at an elite level and say okay that's that's maybe something that where we want to get to what what type of coach fits that that mold. Uh, and Steve, can I can I just come in there with a, a perhaps a bit of a geeky question uh, for, for the guys because um, I, I really find that fascinating, really, and 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 I think both in football and basketball. Um, you can kind of trace 
the trend over the last 40 years really and, and how the game has evolved and gone from one style to another and and what styles became more dominant and then they go away because something else comes in or or because people get used to that kind of system and then you have to do something different because it, it becomes easier to defend or whatever um to what extent because uh, obviously the, the the whole you know tiki taka again press he's been in the kind of for a good 10 plus years now um to what extent is there an evolution that as well as looking at what's successful now, you might have to look at what might be successful in five years from now. Is that something that, how easy or how hard it is to, to do that in, in, in soccer, in football? Do you want me to take that first? And that, yeah. I, I know that's a really hard question. <laughs> no, I, I think, um, you know, the, in terms of the physicality aspect, um, you know, I think, um, you know, the game, the game is just getting faster, you know, athletes are getting stronger. Um, you know, and I think from that perspective, naturally that, that would lead to a, you know, more quicker, uh, more all action approach to the game. Um, you know, you look at the EPL now, I mean, it's, it's, you know, it's so fast. These guys, these guys are monsters, you know, in terms of, in terms of their, their, their playing profile. Um, you know, and, and I think, you know, the game will, will only continue to, to kind of push those boundaries, um, you know, and to some extent, you know, that, that's a way that, that you can affect a style of play. Um, as I said, I think you, you, there's certain styles and, um, you know, require certain fundamental physical properties. Um, and I think that's a real, it's a real, it's a real thing that, you know, you can, you know, take out the, you know, take out the, you know, the, the technical aspects, you know, in nowadays game, if you can't run, um, you're, you know, you, you're struggling a little bit. Um, yeah, you can hide players and you can, you can master and technical uh, deficiencies, but if you can't run in a top end league, you, I think you, I think you're struggling. So, you know, certainly from a physical aspect, I think that, that will, um, you know, that will um, continue to, to, to trend in the right way. Maybe that's why there's also a, uh, an uptick in, you know, in, in the American players now, you know, they're, they're, you know they're, where there hasn't been in the past. I mean, you know, historically, you know, you know and, you know, you know somewhat uh, stereotypically, you know, the, you know, the Americans, you know, they breed athletes. Uh, and so, you know, the guys like Weston McKenney, you know, you know, um, Tyler Adams, those types of the, the players that are terrifically talented individual skill wise, also are terrifically talented in terms of the physical capabilities. Uh, and so, you know, I think um, there, there are going to be waves and peaks and troughs, but from a fit from, from to answer your question from a physical standpoint, I think that's one that that I think will always continue. You'll always continue to, to, to push the boundaries there in terms of the, the, the speed of the game. I mean, David, I just sort of add a little bit on that. Um, in terms of obviously, you've come from a background initially, your career progression where you sort of heavily involved with player recruitment uh, and, and all the processes go that go through that. So again, if there's is there that same level of monitoring or that you were you're looking at you believe the needs to be of managers so that you're not only as Sergio says you're aware of who are the best managers now but those you can see are evolving maybe their own styles and personalities that may be you know the next Gagan Press or the next Tiki Taka the next who are slowly developing the next kind of successful tactical way of playing. Yeah absolutely and I think um as the guys alluded to, the game is sort of on a modern trend now where it is a high ultra oppressive offensive style. So, see teams like Liverpool, where if you looked at Klopp when he first came in, he probably didn't have quite the squad that he wanted to play the style that he had done at Dortmund and, and Manx. But um, because of the long term plan of the club, that this is, they bought into, they identified that style and they wanted it to, to be played. So, they supported that structure and to build that structure over a period of time. Now, um, this sort of came where, you know, it's just quite a Germanist style of playing, this sort of ultra aggressive pressing and the attacking third. So um, when it came into England, it was sort of very Germanesque. It was because I think here we've always 
we've gone through trends of like styles of how we like to play like possession based high pressing based direct based and when you're when you're employing a manager definitely to suit the culture of your club it also has to be aware of your succession planning with your recruitment of your squad as well so if a coach comes in and he has this style of play and you've agreed this is the style of play you want to implement and you haven't quite got the playing personnel to do that right now then if your succession plan is over three years then that then that works fantastically well because that gives you a time to reshape the squad and young players coming through to fit in with that if you bring in a coach to play in that style and he hasn't got a squad straight away and, he's, and he has to win at all costs and it's, it's not going to work so again it's just like you said understanding the environment of what both manager and players are coming into and what on what is the and what is the value style of play and you know the objective straight away I think, yeah, I think, well, we now sort of will kick into that, the realities of that, that recruitment process and maybe start it with a, with a question from Paul White here who uh, says, when you're appointing a first team manager, um, coach, um, how much consideration do you give to, to their team in terms of what they will look to bring in as well? Um, is that part of the conversation or... Are you clearly defining what you you need, and they're having to fit with, with what your requirements are in either the short term or long term, or you will be like, right, I'm going to do this, and they would they go as far as identifying how they would look to change things in the short to long term? Yeah, I think you have to have a sort of like um, an unwritten agreement during the, during the stage of when you're when you're speaking speaking to potential coaches that um, so there's not too much there's not going to be too much sort of conflict further down the line there's obviously going to be some discussion around a number of things as you get as you delve deeper into the season but um, it is that sort of unwritten agreement that you try and get as much alignment as you as you can and of course you know, you don't want to be completely rigid and want them to be marginalised by, you know, the step-by-step process. This is what you are doing all the way through. You have to allow, you know, the, you know, a manager's coach's personality to take shape on the squad and to take shape within the club as well. And that's what another part of what you're doing. So there is some flexibility within that. Of course there is, because you can't, because you're dealing with human beings and football such an emotional situational game. So there has to be some flex, some flexibility on that, but also some of keeping to, you know, keeping to the objectives as much as you can as well. So it, it is allowing that balance and that process to evolve as naturally as you can. Yeah, I think, I think, um, I think certainly you have to give the coach some freedom to, um, you know, to, uh, to to bring in, you know, certain certain people with him or her. I think I think that's that's only natural. I think most of the most of the time now, um, you know, if you have a structured kind of department, you, you know, you you can say, okay, you can bring in one or two guys. I think also it depends on how you know if you're bringing in uh, or you're changing your style, for example, or changing your, your philosophy or vision, and you're moving to a certain style. Then that head coach may be comfortable, maybe wanting to bring in a physical coach, for example, who who knows that you know that way of of thinking, way of the coach I want wants to play, uh, and then you know likely is an you know assistant coach or first team coach who who basically is the soundboard and and is the is the you know in, in a lot of cases I guess the brains of the uh, behind the, the you know the organisation in terms of um, you know the, the staff so. You know, I think I think you have to you have to be you know aware of that, and you have to give like you say support. Um, you know that 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 coach as well. But I think you know certainly in um, in a league like MLS, whereby it's very nuanced. You know there are a lot of different things you have to deal with in terms of you know altitude. You know playing on a baseball field at Yankee Stadium. Um, you know you you know the, playing it uh, in you know minus degree weather in Colorado in, you know, in March. Um, you know, I think there, there are certain things there that, that, that we would like to retain in terms of the knowledge base of the, uh, of the club. Um, but yeah, you know, I, I think you have to have give um, the, the new coach coming in some level of, 
of comfort in terms of um, who you know, he or she would like to bring in. I, I think that's only natural. Yeah, is to what extent, so one of the, uh, in the sample of 17 coaches that we had, about 50% of them were from individual sports and the other 50% from team sports, right? Um, and obviously this is pro probably more important in the team sports, but coaches talked about the importance of having the big players in the team on your side. And, and I was going to ask you, when, when you're recruiting a coach, what level of consultation happens with the players, if any? Um, from our perspective, we haven't necessarily um, in, involved the players at all, uh, to be honest with you. I, I think, um, you know, I, I, you know, it's just one of those things whereby I think we, we have, we, it, it's, it's how you know, it's knowing your club as well yeah. is part of this. I think our, our players are, um, it, it's a hard working bunch. And I think, you know, from this process and, and knowing those players, you know, as I said, through a manager who was an excellent man manager, um, I, you know, we've, we've got to know our players quite well. And uh, I think in the, in the main, you know, players want to, um, players want to be given instruction. Uh, there's a lot of coaches that, you know, let players be free, but I think most players that are, you know, want to be given solutions and want to, um, you know, be be advised on whether they're doing well or not in what the coach wants. Uh, and so, you know, I think from our perspective, we, again, it's more of a knowing that uh, and knowing our group uh, as it is, um, you know, how can we fit a head coach um, into that? So I wouldn't, I wouldn't say we've necessarily involved the coaches a lot. We probably will do. We probably, when we get down from, a, you know, some of the senior leaders, we, we, we may do. Uh, you know, and just to get their kind of advice on who we're bringing in and, and what the what the group thinks. But to be honest, I don't think it will be a major part of of what what we do right now, or it hasn't been. I mean, for you, David, was that something you were able to do? I mean, considering you weren't there that long, maybe you weren't having that sort of relationship with the players. Yeah, I mean, you can still build a relationship with the players. I mean, that's that's not a problem. It's just I, I think with with someone like Huddersfield, to sit, it, any club's always about the situation you're in, and there was a multiple transitions going on at the time. Um, not only from the new management perspective, um, players coming down from Premier League into Championship, so what the squad would would look like. Um, I came in after the first um, January transfer window. So there was players within the group that wanted to still play at the highest level in the Premier League or in European leagues. And there was clubs that wanted to buy into the new structures and the new processes. So the only way that could be affected is is for the when it was looking at the management um, new management that come in was to build those relationships up until the January transfer window until we could affect it. So um, you're looking for as much buy-ins and as much relationship building uh, as possible. And also with the new ownership going on and um, stopping the route of winning games, there were so many other external factors that were going on. But of course, we wanted to build those relationships um, with the players and all the staff going forward to eventually, we knew that it was going to take sort of a good year, 18 months to transition, especially the playing side, into what the philosophy of the club looked like um, long term. Because that's, that wasn't going to be done overnight. That's why the first year's objective for a club like Huddersfield was just to remain um, consolidated in, into the championship and reduce expectations and allow those processes to take place as naturally as they could. I wonder when in, in then in that process you had um, when you're sort of narrowing down your candidates to five and beginning the interview process, when you begin the interview process, are you very open minded on the five or you've already ranked one to five? No, not really. Um, there are different strengths and weaknesses in all in all the in all the potential sort of managers head coaches there was no no one really 
stood out necessarily than one over the other, like by significant amounts. So it was all uh, they all had pretty pretty good um, qualities of what what we were looking for as the overall package and what the club was looking for. So, but it's like with any process, if you didn't know some of the managers personally, which I didn't and the ownership didn't, it's about that interview process and about building those relationships and getting the right feel. So they're getting a feel for us, we're getting a feel for them. Um, and then I think after that stage, then then you can start to really narrow down your focus because you've got that sort of personal and an affiliation of, you know, yes, these, you know, that these potential candidates really feel good. And there's, there's always going to be posing questions that come up during that, especially face-to-face -face interview phase that are going to make potential candidates stand out more than others. Um, for other for what they say or the response to what what we're asking them, so um, that's when you could come down to sort of your final two, and we didn't want to drag it down to any more than what was needed because we did need to appoint a manager in a you know short space of time. So the process was pretty quick, and during that phase of interviews, that's when you we really got to know which ones would be ideal for us at that current time. Yeah, we sort of yeah, jump in a bit more on that in a, in a moment. I was sort of bringing Stuart, um, and you did mention Stuart. There's a point where you you kind of already know the manager. And I'm just sort of just building the topic around this idea of yeah, that decision making process. How how long do you keep it objective for? Is there a point where you kind of there's a part of you that already has made a decision before you're getting too deep into the process? Uh, <laughs> I don't necessarily think make a decision. I think one of the the, the strategies I think we, we we've used is that obviously we have our our core essential criteria uh, that we've decided we've discussed uh, and, and we want to to get as close to now as part of our kind of initial kind of I guess interview processes. Um, we didn't share that with the uh, with with the with the candidates. So we didn't say to the candidates, "This is what these are the five things that we want to do. Go ahead and discuss." Because I think, you know, in the process of this, also when you're doing the background checks, you get uh, information to say, "Well, he'll tell you everything you want to hear in the interview, and then he'll be a disaster." So you know, I, I think um, what we did and what we we, we are doing. Um, is is almost kind of having that initial interview process just as a just as an informal chat uh, and just to see you know probe where some of those visions and some of those kind of principles if they are lying with us um, and, and then you know you get a quick idea in terms of you know whether that person is going to be a good fit for you um, and um, you know, your strategy when you're hiring these people, your strategy can't be a name. You know, it can't be a name. So to have that, um, you know, person in your head that you think this is the guy, you've got to leave, or, 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 or girl, I guess, this, this has got to, you've got to leave something open there, you know, in terms of, um, you know, in terms of that, that process. So, you know, ultimately, you know, if you interview really well, you know, and hit the check boxes that, we want without knowing what those check boxes are i think that ultimately then you know filters down a lot of people out for you um and we've interviewed quite a few people on that on that first kind of 30 45 minute informal chat uh and got some really good candidates based on that and then you know obviously we would we were building more of those deliverables and say you know now can you present on some of the things that 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 you've discussed and um, again, it gets to a point where you see a lot of game models, right? You see a lot of the same kind of, these are the four principles of play, this is this and the other. And it's really how you, how you um, portray that. And again, it comes back to a lot of the work that Sergio does in terms of, you know, you know what is the passion? What is the energy? What is the, you know, you, you get to really those points whereby you know, I didn't like him or her because, you know, he was a bit dour, wasn't he? Or it's just like, well, these are what these are the criteria that we want. So let's let's just keep going off that. Uh, and I think those are the kind of maybe some of the techniques that that we've that we've 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 employed to to to, to break down and, and rank uh, order um, some of these candidates. But when it comes down to it, it, it's fine margins. It's really what you know. What do you what do you really want? 
Uh, and I think, like I say, it goes to that, you know, nobody's 100% fit. Uh, and so I think whatever, and David's probably the same, whatever coaches that, that he eventually kind of would have hired, probably would have been good at 80% of the things that, that, that were really important to him at the time. Uh, and, you know, as I say, it's, 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 it's how well you've done that. And can you walk away saying that I couldn't really have done any more here? This is, this is, this is the, this is the art, you know, atypical type of coach we want and then hiring for her. I mean, Sergio, you've heard two very sort of David and, and Stuart have sort of um, defined two very sort of structured processes there. I know with some of your research, you sort of mentioned the kind of, People just get lucky strikes. We've seen it in football, just uh, hiring former players who just based on successful playing records rather than a successful coaching record. And, you know, you could be lucky or not with that. But um, again, also when you get into this interview stage, I mean, what are the things to avoid in that interview stage where having done all of this fantastic, objective sort of background diligence into a, into a, potential coach that you don't finally fall into a, an objective decision on the final five as Stuart said to avoid that yeah it's a case and maybe it's something that has to be in there basically it'll come down to do we like this guy or not because hopefully you're going to be working with this person for well at least two years and hopefully 10 uh, as the case has been yeah I mean it isn't really uh an exact science okay so like like Stuart said all you can do is get to a point where you feel you've done all your due diligence and at that point is when you're well there might be like it might be your gut feeling that tells you well all these three guys are 80 percent but this one feels better um it might be that you are you might be conditioned by other things by the salary demands or, or or whatever it is so in the end the decision might not be made by you but but by what you can afford um or someone may, may come and, and take him you know snatch him from you in the last minute um I, i'm always curious to to think that we could start trying to identify these guys a bit earlier um and and track them a bit earlier and and i don't know if uh, I'm really keen to explore, and I know this is really difficult in professional sport, but there, there are some examples now where, so Real Sociedad in, in Spain, uh, who are doing quite well this year, uh, they've got uh, Xabi Alonso coaching the second team. Uh, and Xabi Alonso was doing his all his coaching qualifications way before he stopped playing. Um, and, and having had a chance to meet Xabi Alonso face-to-face -face at, at the UEFA Pro Licence course last year, it is someone that you go, hmm, I mean, this guy is definitely material to consider. Uh, and I think the Real Sociedad has done a great job there in terms of saying, well, do all of this and and we're going to offer you a chance to coach the second team here for as long as you want to cut your teeth. And when you're ready, you're ready. And 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 I don't know if every, every club can do that, but that's something that to me is something worth exploring going forward at the level of, um, yeah, I mean, do, can, can your your club develop that um, conveyor belt of of, of former players uh, that and I'm not, I'm not advocating for former players only. Don't get me wrong. The, I think the same level of talent identification should be done with with non elite athletes. Okay, um, but in, in in some cases, really, I think it might be quite um, quite a no brainer for some people to encourage. I, think, I guess what I'm coming from is. A lot of the serial winning coaches mentioned that in the in the trajectories as a coach, they could pinpoint it down to a point where just before they were, you know, they were gonna stop playing, someone said to them, I think you could make a really good coach. Have you thought about that? Uh, and and we would like to support you in, in that period. Um so whether we can also look for those coaches that perhaps have that that material in advance um, and how we support them in the long term, uh, that, that that's interesting. But in terms of being able to make that objective decision at the end, um, I don't know if perhaps something that we've not explored enough when we are signing players, or for example, when I was, so uh, uh, as a basketball player, I coached division one basketball 
here in both in the men's and the women's and I coach national teams. And we used to make a lot of phone calls and this happens for players to the former coaches, to former teammates, to other coaches, to find out a lot about the players. And I don't know if we we do that enough with the coaches. Are we are we talking to enough? And I don't know, I'm asking David and Stuart, do we talk to enough people to really make sure that we know that what they are putting across in the interview is not just a front? Uh, is that is that something that 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 you guys do or that most people do or yeah, of course. And you want to, and I think it comes down to um, similar to when you do your player information, trusted sources, um, people that know the club, the people that you personally trust. And so it's reliable information because you can get all sorts of information coming into you that, like you say, they could act what you want to do. They could become, you know, very, very polite and yes and tell the answers they want to hear during the interview process so your information you do diligence beforehand of like, like you would a player to get as much as delve into their background what makes them tick what 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 is their what is their pressure points doing what's going to make them bring success to this, to this particular club does it marry up with you know what's what's being said during the interview process so I think you have to do your information the same way you would you would do a you would do a player, and because the head coach is going to be an integral part of the club, it's going to be the face that represents the club in many ways. So you have to have someone that's gonna that you know that you've done as much as sort of profile and characteristic information as you can. Yeah, for sure. I mean, that's you know, hundred percent. I think um, you know, I agree with everything uh, that what David said, uh, and, and we do similar, you know, similar similar stuff. I think I, I think you have to. I think you know, a wide range of sources as well. You know, ex players, what players think. You know, sporting directors. You know, um, all the different avenues that you can get to build a case to get closer to that eighty percent um, fit. I think you know, you you, you you generally do that. You want to do that. So. Yeah, I would, I would concur with everything there. I mean, on that, Stuart, as well, I mean, you sort of mentioned it in your presentation that um, yeah, you're only going to get an 80% fit. There's going to be lots of things going on within the process. You know, you may not be the only club interested in that person as a manager, which means you may have to then go to a second, third choice. So yeah. what, are, what are the compromises? What are the ones that you've been willing to make? Which ones are you think, right, we can give or take that one, and what are the absolute? No way, that one has. To, that's a that's a that's a deal breaker. Uh, I think the cultural fit one is one that we would stand firm by. Uh, I think that's an important one. I think um, you know when you talk about experience, uh, you know, and experience as a coach, uh, I think that's one where maybe we we have maybe some flexibility because then. You know, you never know until you give these people a chance. Uh, it depends who's out of work. It depends who's in work. It depends, you know, the quality of the coaches out there that fit your style. As, as David alluded to before, I think, you know, you can filter down a lot of these coaches based on that, that alignment. And if the coaches aren't out there that you identify as your number one, two, three, or for whatever reason you can't get, then you, know, you might have to make a sacrifice in terms of, on one that's an experienced one and knowing that you might take some lumps along the way um, but uh, it's one that is is one that hopefully in the medium to long term will bear fruit and um, it's it's a case of maybe hiring someone that can get you easy gains now but maybe doesn't have the upside uh, you know in, in the future um, so you know I think that's certainly one thing whereby you know the experience part and a lot of there's a lot of talk in how much experience actually matters right you want to gain experience by doing the job you know a lot of these um you know younger coaches now that are being hired are, are assistant coaches or you know head of under 23s or whatever it is um and they don't have that that experience um i i think it's a little bit unique in mls because i think to some extent experience does matter in mls and history will tell you that in terms of the winning coaches that have won MLS Cup over the last six years, seven years. I think there's only one uh, foreign coach in Tata Martina that was with Atlanta and they were a big, big new franchise team that 
that that he's a pretty big heavyweight within MLS. Um, and he's a top, top elite level coach who had all his staff with him there. Um, so I think I, I think experience certainly is 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 one uh, whereby trait that that we're probably you know you have to give a little bit on. Uh, but certainly things like you know cultural fit, um, you know that kind of thing. I, you know I, I don't think you can I don't think you can give that up as a as a as a negotiable. And yeah, for you, for you, David. Yeah, I, I would agree with Stuart. That was one of our main ones, um, especially because I think you can you can compromise a little bit on sort of tactical frameworks throughout the season, depending on sort of squad injuries. And as you go forward, you're going to have to have allowed that. You can't just say I want to play a four-three-three or four-four-two. You have to allow some flexibility on that given the sort of situations at the time. But cultural and character fix were, were key for us because especially, I think for Danny and Nicky as well, they came from um, a background where they, as a smaller club where they were the manager, so they had more of a, more of a say on sort of some of the other decisions that went on. And it was quite new for them to come into a structure where it was going to be working with myself as a sporting um, director or director of football. So to have as much as alignment on culture and characteristic fix was it was important because we didn't want to um, have any unforeseen issues where, you know, there could be sort of problems that, that wasn't um, spoken about during sort of uh, the first stage. So I think for us at, at that current time, they, that, that was absolutely crucial. Fantastic. All right, guys, I think that's a, a good place to, to wrap things up for, for this evening. I think we sort of managed to get through a hell of a lot in the last hour or so. So, uh, yeah, just like to, again, say a big thanks to uh, David Webb. Pleasure. No problem at all. Thank you for having me. Uh, to Stuart Mayers. Thanks a lot, Steve. Thanks, guys. And to uh, Sergio Lara Bercial. Thanks a million. Very enjoyable. Thanks. And yeah, to everyone out there who's joined us this evening, a big thank you to you as well. Uh, we'll hope to see you again on the Sunday session next week.